This is Access Ann Arbor. Hi, my name is Ralph Harris. Um, down here at CTN Studios, they call me the military guy, and my friends call me Ralph, and my enemies, I'm not so sure what they call me, but I'm very happy to have this program going on today. It's, today's uh, program is about Vietnam. I've done three of them on Vietnam. I also have done programs on Korea, World War II, that's Europe and the Pacific theaters, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and um, it's a pleasure to bring veterans um, into your home to tell us about uh, their experiences. Um, before our guests introduce the guests and before our guests tell us about their roles in Vietnam, I'd like to share a few historical facts about that war. There are a lot of young people, especially I know the, some of the history classes in, in Ann Arbor watch these programs, but they don't really remember because they're not old enough and they don't know the details. So in a short, I'll give you a short history. In 1946, Vietnam was declared a free state under French control. The Chinese nationalist troops who were occupying Vietnam at the time moved north back to China. In 1947, Vietnam became an associated state with the French Union. In 1950, Ho Chi Minh declared the formation of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and claimed to be the only legal government. The Brits, the British, and the United States governments recognized a rival to Ho Chi Minh. Military fighting erupted between French troops and Ho Chi Minh's forces. In the meantime, China became a communist state and assisted Ho Chi Minh's forces in the fighting. In 1954, the French lost a major battle called Den Vinh Phu in what became known as North Vietnam. In 1955, the French troops moved to South Vietnam. In 1962, the United States sent supplies to the French. In 1963, the United States sent military advisors to help the South Vietnam troops defend their territory. In 1964, North Vietnamese patrol boats attacked the United States destroyer Maddox. The United States retaliated with bombing raids on North Vietnam. In 1965, the first U.S. Marine combat units entered Vietnam at Da Nang, and the Great American Buildup began. In 1973, the last American troops left uh, on March 29th after a slow withdrawal of American troops. In 1975, President Gerald Ford declared the war finished. Few facts. Over 3 million United States Armed Service personnel served in Vietnam. Over 57,000 of our people died. United Forces were never defeated in a major battle. And now, uh, before we get into some of the details, I'd like to have our, introdu our guests introduce themselves. Uh, first is? Uh, <coughs> I'm Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles. United States Army. United States Army. There you go. I'm Captain Jack Myers, United States Marine Corps. I'm Corporal Marvin Rivers, United States Marine Corps. I know all of you well, and I'm glad that you're all three here. Um, since we're no longer in the service, is it okay if I call you by your first names or a nickname? Sure, sure absolutely. absolutely. I right, thank you very much for that honor. Um, um, Charles, uh, would you tell us about, uh, um, what's your, where's your hometown? Born here in Ypsilanti and reside there now, retired. What year? Well, that's telling your age. Is that all right? 1930. Okay. He's old. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And how about you, Jack? Well, I was originally I came from uh, West Virginia. I was born and raised in New Martinsville, West Virginia. And we've lived in Chelsea now for 30 years. You know, we have something in common because I was born in St. Albans, West Virginia. Yes. We've talked about We've that. Talked I was about born on a hillside in an unpainted house. I don't know about you. Uh, and Marv, where's your hometown? Dexter. Yeah, but for the last eight years, I live in Chelsea. But not in an unpainted house. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the branches of service are obvious to me and to us. But how about for our audience? Uh, Charles, you were in the uh, United States? United States Army. Absolutely. And Jack? U.S. Marine Corps. Do or die. U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, we're out, we're out, no, we're not out, no, we're two and two, okay. Uh, what was your new, uh, unit, uh, Chuck? 
Vietnam first tour was the 176th Assault Helicopter Company, which was in direct support of the 1st Brigade 101st Airborne Division. Now Second tour was in the Delta, uh, which is the lower part of Vietnam, and uh, was the 121st Assault Helicopter Company, Thanks. which I commanded at that time. And those helicopters are called Hueys, aren't they? Yes. Okay. And Jack, uh, what were well, you I, at? What you when, when I went to Vietnam, I was in Force Logistical Command, and I worked in the finance uh, office. Uh-oh. You handle the money. Yes. And also my second duty was uh, I was a uh, backup or a platoon leader for the Northern Perimeter uh, Reactionary Platoon. That sounds like that might be a hot job. That it was on time at times, yes. No. How about you, Mark? I was with the Second Battalion, 26 Marines, Fifth Marine Division, and we were what we call afloat. We did our operations off board ship. Really? Yes. What ship? Uh, well, we had two um, actually converted aircraft carriers. They carried helicopters, yeah. and then we had two LSDs that where we had the. Uh, amphibious landing. And nowadays, if I'm not mistaken, the Marines have their own uh, sh ships that are designed to have helicopters. They didn't take an aircraft carrier and turn it into it. Is that true? Right. Yeah. Well, actually, those were those were converted like uh, destroyers, and they, they redid them and put a flat top on them. Okay. Chuck, what were your job and duties? I mean, you're lieutenant colonel or were. I mean, realize you're commanding men and all that. Well, I was a major uh, first <coughs> while in Vietnam. Uh-huh. And... Uh, First tour was again with the 176th Assault Helicopter Company, and I had the first platoon, uh, which was regard was called a slick platoon. In other words, it was now when you say platoon, you're talking about a number of helicopters, aren't you? Pardon me. A, a number of helicopters and a platoon. Eleven. Each platoon, uh, lift platoon, had eleven helicopters. Okay. Because the public doesn't know that. They Pardon me? Usually, uh, Army guys think about a platoon as a bunch of men. You're talking about a group of helicopters. Yes. Okay. And crews, of course, to and go crews, with it. Sure. And crews, Support. And how about you, Jack? Well, I, uh, like I said earlier, I, uh, I had the reactionary platoon. And uh, when we weren't under attack, of course, I was uh, in the finance office and paying Marines. Yeah. And how about you, Marv? I appreciated the pay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had actually give four jobs. So I first went over, I was with 106 recoilless rifles. Uh, later I carried- Big, long cannon-like things bound on a Jeep, aren't they? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, actually ours were on what we call mules or they would be on a tripod yeah. right on the ground. Uh, then I carried a radio for a grunt company. And the last half of my tour, I went to S2 and became a, what we call an S2 scout because I had language. I could speak a little bit of Vietnamese. Uh, on my last day, I was a minesweeper. I found one. <laughs> you found a mine? Yeah, I, later on they told me they make equipment to search those things out. I didn't have to use my feet. Oh, come on. You're <laughs> just joking with us a little bit. And I, and I fell for it. You know, when I was in Berlin after World War II, we had, um, uh, um, uh, what are we talking about? Minesweepers. Mines. No, no, okay. not minesweepers. The recoilless rifles. Oh, the recoilless rifles, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, and they were mounted yep. on jeeps, and yes. they were supposedly going to stop the Russian army from taking Berlin. I'm not sure about that. Um, Chuck, how old were you when you joined up the army? Well, I was drafted in 1951 at okay. the age of 21 for the Korean War. Uh -huh. And uh, But by the time I got to Korea, why the war had been over by five months. That's not a bad thing. How no, about you, Jack? When, how were you? Um, well, I uh, graduated from high school, and about 13 days after that, I was at Paris Island, and that was 1962. And I stayed in, retired at 82. So you weren't always old? No. Okay. Just <laughs> recently. <laughs> how about you, Mark? Uh, I went in at age 19. Yeah, same, me too, 19. Yeah. Um, how about... Uh, some of your missions, Charles, I know that you had one mission that I hope you talk about, and that's that one where you got the Distinguished Service Cross, wasn't it? That's correct. And uh, you want to talk about that mission? Well, in brief, I mean, 
the thing went on for a whole day, but uh, in brief, we simply uh, led a flight of uh, six helicopters uh, into an ambush situation or to extract the ground troops from an, an, from an ambush. And uh, there's a fallout from that. Why? That's why I was awarded it. And um, on the ranking order of Medal of Honor down, uh, where does the Distinguished Service for us? It's sit? number two, second number to two. the Medal of Honor. So there's only, I want to make sure the audience understands this, there's only one higher medal that you could get. That's correct. And that would be the Medal of Honor. That's correct. So that's an amazing, amazing thing that you have. And thank you for that. Uh, Jack, how about you? Well, uh, I can recall a couple of incidents, but the main one, I was on my way down to the office, and uh, I was 40 or 50 yards away, and uh, the building took a rocket. These are 122 millimeter Chinese communist rockets, and they're about six foot long. And uh, so I went back the other way to get the reactionary platoon out on the line. What, did, what is a reactionary platoon? Tell well, the audience. Well, any time we come under attack, I had to get... You guys went to where the fighting was? Yes. You heard somebody shooting, you're going there? Yes. And so getting those guys up, I had to pass the, uh, the office, the building was called a hooch. It was an oversized... We used to sleep in hooches, which is... A, hardback tent. It's slang words. for a place that you stay in. Yes, okay. uh, but this was the finance office and what happened was the rocket hit directly where my desk was. My desk was like put together if you chop it in the middle and I'm sorry to say I forgot to bring a piece of shrapnel that was in the chair where now I sat. Shrapnel is a piece of the shell that came off when yes, it exploded. exactly okay. and it's it's like a corkscrew. I'm glad I didn't get corkscrewed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Marv? Um, <clears throat> our battalion was afloat, and we would do missions on land anywhere from two to eight weeks. And then we'd spend about two days on board ship. And, uh, on the we helicopter would, ship. Yeah, yeah or, or, on, or on the LSDs. Back? Yeah, or on the, yes, and, and or on the LSDs. Okay. And uh, while we're on board ship, they, they would go over our next mission. And they told us we were going to go on to a hot beach and we we're going to do a amphibious landing. And a hot beach means people are going to shoot at you. That's, yeah, expect, expect to be guys. fired on. And we rolled up on, on the, uh, onto the beach and the back of the doors of the Am Amtrak's open up and you run out and then throw off your packs and then we advance by squads up the beach. And up there were four guys from NBC News filming us. <laughs> <laughs> So you got a little fame there. Yeah. All right. Uh, Chuck, did you ever see any any uh, combatants up close, or were you up in the helicopter more or less where you could tell what they were doing because they were firing at you and all that? But did you get close enough to one of them to see his eyes or get close you enough mean to the smell enemy? them? You're speaking of the enemy. Of the enemy, yeah. No, I was never that close to them. You're a lucky man. And how about you? Uh, I did. Uh, Jack? One of the troops that worked for me wanted to switch to 3rd MPs. That's a scout and sentry dog. Uh, and so I Milita drove him down. MPs of military police, yeah. yeah. Correct. Sure. And I drove him down uh, to Da Nang in the Jeep, and uh, we took fire. Uh, on that trip, I saw the dust flying alongside the road, and I turned around, and there was an individual taking bead on us up by a, uh, their mosque or whatever they call them over there and so all I, I had a 45 on and so I just threw it in lower gear but anyway when I got down to 3rd MPs they had a, a body or a group of VCs. That's Viet Cong. Viet Cong. That was a non-uniformed yeah they all had the black, black silk pajamas yeah. on and uh, that's as close as I came to them. That's close enough. How about you Marv? Uh, yeah, I was involved in many firefights, but when I was with the um, uh, S2, when I was an S2 scout, if they captured somebody, I was in charge of him, got him on the helicopters and sent him back, and sometimes I would talk with him as little as I could with the Vietnamese, but uh, about three or four times, uh, the, the, knowing the language uh, helped save lives. Oh, that's excellent. 
Um, Chuck, did you ever uh, think you might not survive and come home? Well, that, <clears throat> I don't recall that ever being in the forefront of my of my mind. Is uh, God, I know if I was in a helicopter and people were well, shooting me, I'd be worrying about it. I think there's an advantage in being lead and responsible for the entire mission yeah. because uh, you've You're got worrying about more to do. Than yourself. I got it. Uh, it taxes the brain about as much as it could. Yes, sir. And uh, so I think those other thoughts, probably th those behind who have to follow, would have uh, a bigger problem with that, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. How about you, Jack? Do you ever think you wouldn't, might not survive and come home? No. I, I guess during all the fights that, that I went through, uh, I guess the adrenaline's flowing so much and you're just keyed up. Uh, you don't even think about that. You do your job. Good Marine. And how about you, Marv? Ditto. When the, uh, at, when the action's on, you're doing your job. You're trained very well and, and you do your job. After I stepped on the mine, though, there's a little doubt there. That's going to get up to my <laughs> next question for all three of yeah. you. Um, Chuck, were you uh, wounded, wounded or have any close calls? Must have had some close calls. Well, probably some close calls I mean, <clears throat> in that mission that you referred to earlier. Yes, sir. Uh, when we were in the L's, uh, in the landing zone, picking up the last uh, eight troops there, mortar round went off just off the nose of the helicopter and took out part of the windshield left and right and the chin bubble on the left side, and then mortar round went off on the aft of the tail boom, which caused it to lurch forward when they attempted to fire. Okay. How about you, Jack? Well, there was one, uh, the closest I ever came to it was uh, I was walking behind the hooch one, one morning, and uh, you could hear bullets flying. And sip, then, sip, sip. yes, and uh, I thought to myself, I better get, get that platoon out. That's all I could think about. Well, a rocket hit about that time. It knocked me off my feet, bounced me like a basketball on the ground. It was that close. And, of course, I picked myself up and got out of there. The unfortunate thing of this story is when that rocket hit, in the bunkers have air pockets. And there was a sergeant in there reading his letter from his wife. She just had their first child. Oh. He took a piece of shrapnel on the back of the skull. And I thought, oh, my God. Did he die? Yes. Oh, man. That's terrible news. Uh, how about you, Marv? I know you were wounded. Matter of fact, you've got a couple of ankles that still don't work right. Yeah, and it's actually in my feet. Yeah, I've got shrapnel yet in my feet. And they're still in there? Yeah, I, uh, I have chronic osteomyelitis in my heel. That's a fancy word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you're walking and I'm glad you're here. Um, can you think of any events, Chuck, that you could describe of something that you'll never forget besides the mission, that uh, the obvious big mission that you were on? where you got the Distinguished Service Cross. Anything that sticks in your mind that said, I'll never forget that day because, or that action or that event? Well, only a, a failed mission when we attempted to rescue uh, some of our people from a POW camp. And uh, Was that in North Vietnam? Pardon me? Was that in North Vietnam? Negative. Okay. It was in South Vietnam. South Vietnam, all right. But <clears throat> they had uh, they had moved them probably no more than an hour prior to our arrival. If there were fires still in the compound uh, smoldering, and we therefore were an unsuccessful at getting them. I imagine you felt bad about that for sure. Well, yes. How about you, Jack? Well, this is kind of a humanitarian thing that uh, we built a uh, orphanage at the south end of the logistical command, and I'd go down there on Sundays, about the only time I got off, with uh, candies, and I'd, there's children in there, no legs, arms, so on and so forth. And this little boy it kept running up to me. Every time I'd go down there and I'd pick him up and walk around, I got pictures of that at home, and uh, I thought, boy, I wish I'd have brought him back with me, adopted him. but. Uh, I didn't, obviously. Wow. But that was, that was kind of tough. No kidding. Seeing those children. How about you, Marv? Uh, when you're out on missions, um, we run across a lot of tunnels. 
and then on one mission we found a three-story hospital underground. And so that was quite fascinating you know, to, to go through that. We had a guy in the honor guard once, his name was Randy, and he was a tunnel rat. He was a little yeah. guy. Randy Johnson. You remember Randy? Yeah. And I can't imagine crawling underground. Yeah. Oh, man, that's, I, I, no way. Chuck, when did you come home? Uh, first tour would be November 67, and uh, second tour was uh, 71. Okay. When did you come home, Jack? I was over there from... Uh, May 1st of 68 and the end of May 69 I got back. Okay, Marv, how about you? I uh, went over on my birthday in May 22nd and I came home in April of 69. Good. And um, Chuck, when you came home, how were you treated by friends, family, whatever? Well, I don't think there was any particular difference. I mean, I had six children at that time and uh, Went to uh, Fort Sam Houston in Texas, of course, has always been very favorable toward the military. And uh, so I didn't get any of that flack that uh, others may have gotten in other areas of the country. How about you, Jack? Well, the, really the only thing that happened to me is uh, I was on an aircraft coming out of California back to the east, and there was a uh, elderly couple sitting next to me on the airplane and they asked me where I was coming from and I told them I was coming out of Vietnam. Of course I was excited that I'm going home. Yeah. They didn't talk to me the rest of the trip after I said I was coming out of Vietnam. That was it. I tried to make conversation and they just flat would not talk to me. Well they had all that anti-war stuff and uh, they were taking it out on you guys. You're just doing your duty doing mm -hmm. what you're supposed to be doing. Right. How about you Marv? Well, I came home on a med flight on a C-130 to uh, Great Lakes Naval Hospital, but I remember being on crutches going down Main Street to Mass Shoe, shoe Store yeah. and uh, going to get some uh, get some shoes. And um, a jackhammer went off in town. They were doing something. The tip, you've heard the story before. It happened to me. No, but I have a similar story. Jackhammer <coughs> went off. I hit the ground. I reached for my crutch thinking it was my M-16. I'm looking for where the fire is coming from. There's people walking by, <laughs> what's he doing, you know? <laughs> My <laughs> wife's best friend husband was in Nam, and they were over at, at her house, and Martha, my wife, dropped a can, a pan, and he was under the table in two seconds. Yeah. Uh, in retrospect, Chuck, what do you think about the Vietnam War and all that happened or hasn't happened and all that kind of stuff? I think that's probably best left to history and that won't be unfolded probably for another two decades before anybody really uh, understands the, the merit or otherwise of that war. Uh, you and I, all of us here, uh, simply did what we were asked to do uh, <clears throat> and uh, so be it. My wife used to say, well, you weren't a shooting guy. And I said, well, uh, when you go in the service, you're not necessarily, you, you do what you're doing. Uh, I know people who spent all of World War II cooking in Oklahoma, for God's sake, and other people mm -hmm. ended up at Omaha Beach in the first wave and were lucky to survive. How about you, Jack? What do you think? Well, I personally feel we won the battles and we won the war. I just wish we would have finished before we left. Well, that's a familiar strain, isn't it? Uh, ever After since, all those lives. Ever since World War II, we haven't really tried to win a war yet. And, Mark? I think the sad thing about it is how it divided the country. Uh, part of that is due to, I think, uh, Washington, D.C. trying to micromanage the war and just leaving it to the people, the generals, who know how to fight a war and dragging it out way too long. And that, that didn't help the... Uh, the civilians, the first thing they could turn to to vent their anger was the guys getting off the planes at the airports. Yeah. Well, um, we're coming down to the end of the program, I think, pretty quick. And I appreciate the three of you being here. You all live in the Ann Arbor area. You're in Chelsea, right, Jack? Yes, yes. And Marv, you're in Ann Arbor? Chelsea. Chelsea, too. Yeah. And I yep. know where Chuck's in Ipsy. 
And it's been wonderful having you here, and thank you for your service. Our and pleasure. And America's proud of you, and I'm proud of you. And you have a nice evening. Thank you. You betcha. Thank, thank you. you.